Welcome to this talk. Now, it looks like the Gates Foundation is funding viral research that I consider to be a completely unacceptable risk. And the role of governments is to protect its citizens from dangers, to protect the lives of its citizens. So I feel that governments need to intervene to control particular rich individuals and uh, organisations which might be a little... Uh, a little inconsistent with what most of us think. Listen to this and see if you agree with me or not. This is from, uh, I've called this existential threat, which is a, existential of course means that which is related to existence, an actual threat to our existence. Now this is from the uh, Senate Homeland Security Committee um, hearings a couple of days ago uh, with the American Senate. And this is from the opening statement by uh, Stephen Quay, who's a MD, PhD, expert uh, to the committee. It's all there. Check it out for yourself. Now, uh, he, 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 I went through the whole thing here and he says, finally, I conclude what I call gain of opportunity research uh, needs a, a, no, a new oversight effort. So I've gone through this in detail. I am going to give it to you, but I want to give you this first because I think this is really important. Now, he's talking about going into caves where humans are seldom found. Places like, oh, I don't know, uh, northern Laos, southern China, northern Thailand, places like that where there's, this sort of research has been carried out, but uh, other places as well. Taking bat fecal samples containing thousands of viruses. Now, uh, I'm sure they contain thousands and millions of types of viruses, a huge number of viruses here. And uh, this is what's happening. Bringing, them, uh, bringing those viruses back to a laboratory and culturing the specimens, growing them up. Now, what, what, what he says the problem is here is that normally if you take a virus in, in the faecal sample in, in the floor of the cave... It's living in what you might call an ecosystem. So there's other viruses, there's bacterial infections. There's sort of controls on it that any particular dangerous virus might not proliferate very much. But if you take that virus and isolate it in a laboratory, you can grow as much of it as you want. It's pretty well limitless. If you want to grow tons and tons of the virus, then you could do because its natural controls are taken away. It's a bit like any other ecosystem that the carnivores will keep the herbivores uh, numbers down. So that's what he seems to be saying here, where a virus uh, that might be controlled in a diverse natural environment is now able to grow unrestricted, unrestricted growth in pure culture. So they can grow up any amount of these that they would choose to do. Natural restraints gone provides an uh, immense increase in opportunity for potential pandemic risk. So we're talking about potential pandemic risk, even without genetic engineering. So that's just taking these viruses, uh, messing around in caves where we really shouldn't be messing around. We should leave the bats to their own devices. Just culturing those is a pandemic risk without jiggery-pokery and genetic engineering that sadly is also being done. Uh, now, this is the goal of the Global Virome Project, uh, a Gates Foundation-funded Foundation funded Eco Health Alliance effort. So, this funding should be examined, in my view, and the activities of Eco Health Alliance should also be investigated. As I've said, the role of government is to protect you and me. If they don't do this, I believe the governments are being negligent in their prime duty. Their stated goal, this is, the, this, is this um, Virome project, according to Dr. Kai Kwekwe, before the uh, Senate hearing, their stated goal, collect an collect the estimated half a million unknown viruses that are capable of infecting humans and bringing them to a laboratory near you. Um, no thanks. I'd prefer that didn't happen. I think the viruses should stay put where they were, controlled in their own ecosystems, 
not in a laboratory near me or near you for that matter. What could go wrong, he says. Well, I can't think of anything that can go wrong, could you? Well, maybe a few things could go wrong. A pandemic with massive lethality, for example, with a hugely transmissible virus with a hugely high uh, infection fatality rate, maybe that could go wrong. That would reduce the population of the world, wouldn't it? If a lot of people died, there'd be less people left alive because the people that died would no longer be alive. And of course, the people that died would no longer be able to reproduce either. Dead people don't reproduce. Um, unpublished dangers. Uh, this, is, this is kind of a separate matter now, really. Uh, unpublished dangerous research being done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So this is still apparently going on. Remember, this, this, this testimony was given on the 18th of July... 18th of June, sorry, 2024. This is this is bang up to date. Um, here we have the original link to the uh, to the uh, the hearings there that we've shown before. That's the the link to the full uh, the full hearings. 18th of June, 2024. That's when it was. Uh, this came out. So there's unpublished dangerous research been done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It's almost as if lessons haven't been learnt. MERS virus, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, 30% lethal to humans. Now, normally this only comes from camels, mostly in Saudi Arabia. Um, and it jumps from camels to humans. It can cause, well, as, as I said, 30% fatality rate with those that are in 30% infection rate. But normally it doesn't transmit much from humans to humans. But if you gain its function, that could well happen. And we could have another coronavirus, a Middle East respiratory syndrome virus with high transmissibility. It doesn't bear thinking about 30% lethality. If everyone was exposed to it, that could potentially kill 30% of the people in the world. Potentially. Probably wouldn't be that high, might only be 15%. Um, and there's also this one called uh, Nifa virus. Uh, Nifa virus, uh, it's more than 70% infection fatality rate. So if you're infected with Nifa virus, 30% chance you'll die, 70%. Sorry, 30% chance you'll live, 70% chance you'll die. Uh, now, my preliminary analysis, says, says Dr. Kwai, my preliminary analysis is that any, any epidemic with a 15% uh, or greater lethality virus will cause civilization uh, to collapse that will last for longer than 250 years. So if more than 15% of people die, uh, civilization will basically collapse for 250 years. Oh, I don't know. Maybe things like civil wars, um, balkanization, chaos, drug lords. A real dystopian uh, possible scenario for 250 years. And um, as well as that, all, all, all the sort of nuclear biological chemical things that are kept under control by people, well, you know, we, could, we could potentially get reactors melting down. I don't know. You know it doesn't bear thinking about. Um, it, it is a real risk that should be taken seriously, which is why I'm making this video. But that's his estimate, 250 years. Uh, it gives an example, March 31st, 2019, a shipment of deadly pathogens from Canada's National Microbiology Lab was sent to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I wonder if the one of those was a... We won't speculate, let's see what he says. The shipment was routed to Winnipeg, from Winnipeg to Toronto and then to buy Beijing on a commercial Air Canada flight. I don't think the passengers were informed. The list of ship viruses. Uh, seven uh, varieties of Ebola, very deadly hemorrhagic fever. The Hendra virus, I'm not familiar with it. Familiar with it. We'll see it's dangerous in a minute. Two strains of Nifa virus, Malaysia and Bangladeshi. Um these are the top three most deadly human pathogens on the planet. 
Let me just tell you what Dr. Kwai said here. Uh, these are the three most deadly human pathogens on the planet. On a commercial airliner going to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, in this case from Canada. Why? Shipped on a commercial airliner full of unsuspecting passengers. And then he would like to see some reforms, and these are listed in great detail. Uh, and this is a man, of course, with about 50 years of scientific experience. While I find no actual benefit from gain-of-function research, so he doesn't see any actual benefit from gain-of-function research. So we should stop it, shouldn't we? I believe efforts to ban it, given the vested interests of literally the entire virology community, and maybe others, maybe other people have a vested interest in this, who could possibly say? Maybe others. If he doesn't know, I certainly don't know. Is a hill too steep to climb? So it looks like he's pessimistic for that reform. 